Welcome back, ninjas. Sensei Silver's here. You've tuned in to Exfiz Ninja. And in today's episode, we're going to kick off the training series of episodes. This first episode will be focused on fitness dimensions, one of those being aerobic power. You may have heard the name Elliot Kipchoge. He's the first runner in history to have gone under two hours in the marathon. He did it in the fall of 2019. Behind me here, I have a treadmill spinning up at that exact pace. Tune into this episode a little bit later to see how long I can last. Welcome to the episode, ninjas. What I'd like to discuss is some of the basic fitness dimensions that I'll be referring to throughout much of the remainder of this series as it relates to training adaptations. Now, fitness dimensions can broadly be categorized into two buckets. One would be considered sports-specific dimensions, and the other would be considered health-related fitness dimensions. Sports specific dimensions would include things like reaction time, balance, coordination, speed, acceleration, things that often involve some training in order to perfect. They're not as raw as some of those health related fitness dimensions. The health related fitness dimensions, conversely, are fairly fundamental fitness attributes that a person can embody and train. Now, I'm not going to discuss all of the dimensions that would typically fall in that category of health-related fitness dimensions, but I will speak to several that have a direct correlation to the content I'll be covering in this series. So, with that being said, the fitness dimensions that I'll cover in that health-related fitness dimension will include muscular strength, muscular endurance, muscular power, muscular hypertrophy, muscular flexibility, anaerobic power, and aerobic power. So there's gonna be several. So what I'll do in this episode is define what each of those fitness dimensions is, how we might measure them, the relevance of those fitness dimensions for you and me, and athletes and clinical populations, you name it, if the adage a picture is worth a thousand words holds true, then I suppose a video will probably be worth even more than that. So I'll be trying to walk us through some of the ins and outs of those fitness dimensions while I've got some videos playing in the background. And I want you to just pay careful attention to movement speeds, range of motion, muscle size, and so on. And of course, if you have questions, just check in with me. All right, without further ado, let's hop to it. Okay, let's talk about our first fitness dimension, which is muscular strength. In reference to your ninja notes, there's a definition for you, and it indicates that muscular strength is the maximum amount of force that a muscle or muscle group can exert in a single effort. One thing I'd like for you to note is I didn't indicate anything about speed or the time duration of that particular muscular effort. It tends to be that muscular strength is very slow. And think back to the neuromuscular series. One of the things that I discussed as it related to increased force output was slowing movements down. And that was so that we could maximize the actin myosin cross bridging, especially when you have concentric contractions where there's some sort of sliding over actin myosin. You want to be able to slow that down to provide the time for maximum cross bridging. So it should make sense then that if someone was doing some sort of movement with the intent of expressing muscular strength, it's going to be fairly slow. We've got a video on screen here for you. This is Vlad Alazov, who has or had the world record for a raw squat. This is over 1,100 pounds. And what I want you to notice in this video is just how slow he's moving in both phases of that lift. 
So eccentrically and concentrically, he's moving quite slow so that he can maximize his force production. In this next video, I've got Brian Shaw, who is currently a World's Strongest Man competitor. And what he's trying to do is tie the world record for the deadlift, also with about 1,100 pounds. And as you can see, he moved rather slow as well. So it seems to be that slow movements are the key to an expression of maximum strength. This is Brian Shaw again. What he's doing is he's pulling a Viking boat. I think it weighs about 12,000 pounds, but up a grade, the estimation is that he's pulling about 60,000 pounds. And as you can see, every, every movement is fairly slow. Now he makes it look easy compared to some of the other strongman competitors, but the key again is that slow movements help maximize muscular strength. And before I finish with muscular strength, I want to reiterate a key part of that definition, the maximum amount of force. I've talked about force in some of those neuromuscular episodes already. I want you to be thinking force is synonymous with strength. Now there's a whole variety of ways that one could assess their muscular strength. One of the most common ways to do that in a gym setting is by getting a one repetition maximum, a one RM is the typical abbreviation of that. Most people would just call it maxing out. There's ways that you can estimate what your one RM is without actually having to do a single maximum effort, but that would be one of the most common ways to try and assess one's muscular strength is to choose a lift and then try to figure out how much can I lift in it one single time. You've seen me use a force plate before in the anaerobic testing episode force plates do look at force that's why they're called force plates so that could be another way for certain exercises to be able to figure out what one's maximum strength is and then you've also seen me use a handheld dynamometer before dynamometer is basically a force gauge and so you can use a dynamometer in a variety of other situations to try and gauge maximum force as well Okay, this next fitness dimension is known as muscular endurance. And in reference to those ninja notes, by definition, it is the ability to perform repeated high intensity contractions or to sustain a high intensity contraction for a long duration of time. Now that's gonna sound a little bit similar to another definition that's coming later in this episode. So I highly encourage you to study this definition verbatim as it's listed in your notes. Now, when I think of muscular endurance, there's a lot of different performances that come to mind. If you've ever had the joy of experiencing a wall sit, that's usually a great example of muscle endurance. I think of ninja warrior and rock climbing. I mean, a lot of grip-based tasks where you may have to hang on something for a long period of time. I could have showed any of those, but really I wanna show you something that's a little more fun. So with this next video, it's a man versus beast challenge. I just made mention of hanging grip endurance types of tasks. Three, Who hangs better than a monkey? <laughs> two, so what you're watching one, is a college gymnast facing off against an orangutan. Feast your eyes on this beautiful example of muscle endurance. Back and forth, taunting the gymnast. Definitely taunting him. The orangutan doesn't seem like he's stressing at all. He seems very relaxed, he's eating, he's scratching. No problem. Bam Bam isn't even flinching. Oh, that's a solid grip. Looks like he could go all day. You know, what's interesting for Marshall is that a typical gymnastic routine on the still ring where he's the national champion only lasts about 35 seconds. And most of the time, he's actually supporting himself above the rings rather than hanging below them. So this is a, a completely different type of test for Marshall. Uh-oh. We're coming up at two minutes and the orangutan is just going actually for it. Actually swinging back and forth. Now this takes some guts. Now I don't know if, if Marshall is trying to get the orangutan to lose his grip. I think Bam Bam's actually trying to get Marshall to lose his focus. And uh, here he's kind of taunting him with some of his acrobatics. And I think if Marshall doesn't stay focused, the orangutan will absolutely win this event. I think the important thing to notice right now is that uh, Bam Bam does have a little bit of difficulty and that he's losing his shorts.
Marshall said before the competition that for him, it really was about stamina and endurance and if he could stay focused. And he was hoping that at some point, perhaps Bam Bam just lost interest, got bored and just came down. Marshall has got to be feeling this part. He said it's very important to shake it out because your forearms kind of get blown out. See, Bam Bam is spraying a leak right now, and that could be a small problem. Now, see, now, he's obviously, Bam Bam has decided to lose a little bit of water weight, but that could be just to distract Marshall. And it has because Marshall's smiling. And you know how that, that is an illegal move. I don't, he's got one hand still on the bar. It's over. It is over. Bam Bam. He tried everything in the orangutan book. Our man, Marshall Irwin, is still hanging. He's very strong, obviously, on the rings and doing the iron cross. Oh, he's oh, down! He is down. Time! Excellent hang. All right, Marshall has just dropped, and I'm going to wait for the official time. And here it is. He was hanging an amazing six minutes and 38 seconds. Sid is down right now with Bam Bam's trainer. I got to give it to the orangutan. Apparently, he violated the rules by touching the sides, but that's very impressive. He made that look so easy. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed that. The last thing I'd like to mention before I move on to the next fitness dimension is that the way we would usually test muscular endurance is something that would be repetitive in nature or long duration in nature. So that might be um, doing as many sit-ups or push-ups as you might be able to do in a certain period of time, like a minute or two minutes. Or perhaps it's just doing as many reps as you possibly can do regardless of time limit. So if you've ever done one of those tests for like a middle school PE class, the whole point of that test was to assess your muscular endurance. Okay. Enough with that, let's move on over to the next dimension. All right, the next fitness dimension is muscle power. Now, muscular power is sometimes thought errantly as the same thing as muscular strength. Strength and power are not the same things. I would like for you, after seeing this episode, to correct anyone that ever uses them interchangeably. Tell them the difference and the world will be a better place. <laughs> so, what exactly is the difference? The equation for power is work divided by the time that it takes to perform that work. And what is work, you might ask? Work is the product of force and distance. Force being the amount of strength one exerts and the distance that you're exerting that strength or that movement over. So. This is not an official definition of power, but I want you to think of power like this. If we were to consider force as muscular strength, right? That's one of the ways I told you you could think about that in that first fitness dimension. And we think of time here as speed, speed of movement. Then loosely, you could consider power to be strength divided by speed. Or another way of thinking about this is how quickly one can exert his or her strength. So power has a time component, but strength does not. So in reference to your ninja notes, definition of power is the rate of work performed. How quickly can you exert your strength? I've got a whole collection of videos here for you to check out. And what I want you to pay attention to is just how fast the movements are compared to the movements in those muscular strength videos that I just provided. Typically, people who exert muscular power move much, much faster. So speed or high velocity is an important component of power. In these first few videos, I've got Olympic weightlifters. Olympic weightlifters would perform clean and jerks, like you just saw snatches where you take a bar from the ground, move it over your head in one fell swoop. And in order to accelerate that bar, they have to have tremendous muscular power. So what I want you to focus on is just how fast they're moving to get around the bar, under the bar, to get their bar over their head. You know, don't factor in the time that they're taking as they're resting, you know, in between movements. Watch the movements themselves. I mean, they're just, they're crazy fast. And these lifters are lifting incredible amounts. So the individual that you just saw who's celebrating quite elatedly, 
he just lifted almost 477 pounds over his head with that jerk. This gal right here is 47 kilograms. She's lifting over double her body weight. And noted that she had to, she had to move very fast to get under that bar. Granted, she took some time to kind of wait, but she moved it up. Some of these next videos here show gymnasts and track athletes doing a lot of jumping. Jumping is a great expression of power because it requires force applied to the ground at a fast rate of speed in order to get yourself off the ground. And pay attention to the body types. Simone Biles, very muscular, but she's rather short, so she looks pretty big. But you'll note that some of these track athletes, they tend to be a little bit taller and more slender. So it's not necessarily just muscle size or body size that indicates whether someone has a lot of muscular power. It has everything to do with the balance of strength expression and movement velocity. Now I can't talk about power without mentioning my man Bruce Lee. I mean one of the most powerful individuals I can think of. Um, he wasn't particularly large but he was very strong for his size and he could move so fast that he could generate a lot of power. So what I'd like to show you here is a few different expressions of that power. He made famous the one inch punch. And the one inch punch was basically a very quick expression of force. So what you'll see in this next video is his first demonstration of the one inch punch to a large crowd. And he had Joe Lewis who was a heavyweight black belt karate champion try to just wail on a guy, really show how much power he could generate with a more traditional punch. And you can see it pushes the guy back a little bit, but then Bruce Lee gets up and does a six inch punch. And what you can see is that when you've got power, the expression of that power has a much larger effect on something else. In this case, another person. He pushed that person a, a pretty far distance. But think about if you were expressing that power against the ground. Well, you would, you would elevate yourself off the ground, right? Because with every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So if I exert a lot of power against the ground, it's going to exert that back to me and boom, I'm off the ground. If I move slow, if I express my force slowly, I don't come off the ground. So power is a key component to running and jumping. I mean, everything you can think of, every human movement that's important for activities of daily living or sport, all involves some component of power. It's, it's absolutely critical to human movement. So power isn't just something that athletes should be concerned with. Everyone should be concerned with this right here. To that end, I have mentioned before this idea of use it or lose it. If we think back to the neuromuscular recruitment strategies, the only way to tap into those fast twitch fibers, the 2A and the 2X, is for someone to try and exert maximum force or to try and move as fast as they possibly can. And if you've got individuals who tend to be more sedentary for long periods of time, say 40, 50 years, and they're not doing the kinds of high force output or high speed or high power activities that would recruit those 2X fibers, well, they tend to die off. And it's not so much that the fibers die, but the, the neurons that would innervate those motor units, they die. So now your fastest twitch fibers, your your strongest, fastest, most powerful fibers are now left de-innervated. You can't turn them on. So that's a great example of use it or lose it, right? If you're not using them, you're gonna lose that maximum power capability. It tends to be that with aging, we also have diminished balance capabilities and that increases fall risk. And if you've ever paid much attention to the elderly populations, Fall risk is a big deal because if someone falls, breaks their femur, that usually precipitates early mortality, early death basically. So we want to want to keep some of those folks with a heightened fall risk, want to keep them from falling. Well, how is it that power segues in with fall risk? 
regularly, if someone might perceive that they're falling, you know, they step on their ankle kind of weird off the sidewalk, whatever, they may just watch themselves fall in slow motion because they don't have the ability to tap into those 2X fibers to very quickly move and arrest the fall. And the reason they don't have that extra power on tap is because they haven't used the 2X fibers. They've become de-innervated. And as a result, we just, we just lost them. We lost the ability to turn them on. It would help then for that population to be able to preserve power capabilities so that if they did happen to kind of take a wrong step, they could move quickly to arrest that fall and, and, and obviously prevent an injury. So it's of great benefit then for some elderly populations to do speed and power oriented training. What I'd like you to reference is the video on screen. There's some functional exercises that can be relatively safe and controlled. You can have some of these elderly populations try that are higher force output in nature that lend themselves to faster movement velocities so that they can try to preserve and improve the power capabilities that they have. So I'm not suggesting that you take your great grandparents, I'm not suggesting that you take them, load up a super heavy bar and do some Olympic cleans and jerks. Those are pretty dangerous, high coordination lifts, but you can do some things in a more controlled manner. These videos are one example of that. As for assessment of muscular power, I've already mentioned force plates. Even though it says force plate, we can also look at the, the amount of time that force is exerted. And so because we can look at the force and we can look at the time, it's very easy to calculate power off a force plate. You can also calculate power using video analysis. If you know how heavy an object is and you're able to track the distance and the time that it covers that distance, it'd be very easy to be able to calculate power. So we see that in motion analysis in biomechanics labs all the time. So I think that's it. I think that's it for muscular power. Let's move on to the next fitness dimension. This next fitness dimension is muscle hypertrophy. <laughs> or, or lack thereof. <laughs> so muscular hypertrophy simply refers to the cross-sectional area of a muscle. And there's a whole variety of ways that you can try to assess that. One of the simplest ways would be with circumference measurements. So you basically would take a tape and you're just going to wrap that around some body segment. That's a wrist, it's the forearm, it's the upper arm. But tape measurements seem to be a common way to try and assess hypertrophy. You can also try to paint a picture for hypertrophy using body composition assessments. Now, I don't think that I could speak about muscular hypertrophy without showing Arnold Schwarzenegger in his prime. As you probably well know, he was a competitive bodybuilder when he was younger, before he became famous with movies and politics and so on. And as you can see, he's quite large. Compared to some of the current bodybuilders, he's actually kind of small, but that's a, a lot of muscular hypertrophy on display right there. Not quite as much as me. We'll give him a pass and say he's close. <laughs> Mind you, from that neuromuscular series of episodes, that fiber cross-sectional area, muscle hypertrophy, does influence one's potential for maximum strength. So if you were to watch a bodybuilder lift, they're not usually weak. They tend to be able to lift quite a bit of weight in a variety of exercises. But if you were to compare the amount of weight that a bodybuilder could lift versus a strength athlete, even though they may both be large, Usually it's those strength athletes that are going to be considerably stronger because that's what they're training for. They're not just training for muscular size. They're trying to train those muscles how to exert maximum force output. In other words, being large doesn't inherently mean that you're automatically going to be strong. There is going to be some strength advantage that comes with that size, but I want to stress that the larger a muscle is, the greater its force output potential is. Potential. So that will have some bearing then with some of the periodization recommendations I'll speak to on the latter part of this series of episodes when we get into training theory. Oh, hey there. You caught me detuning my muscle spindle so I could work on my shoulder flexibility. 
This next fitness dimension is flexibility, and by definition in your Ninja Notes, it's the maximum range of motion we should be able to see out of joint without causing some sort of injury to the soft tissue or joint structures. Now, there's a variety of ways that you might try to assess flexibility directly or indirectly. If we were to look at direct assessments, you would use something like this. This is a joint goniometer. And basically what you would do is you would identify some anatomical landmarks on the body. And then as you move throughout that range of motion, you're going to align certain segments with those anatomical landmarks. And in this situation, it looks like I moved about 132 degrees through my elbow range of motion. Now, it takes training and practice to become really good at goniometry. You have to know all those anatomical landmarks. You have to be consistent with how you apply the arms in reference to those anatomical landmarks and so on. And if you were to try and assess someone's flexibility joint by joint, left and right sides with one of these, that tends to not be very time efficient. But that is probably one of the best ways to truly identify joint range of motion at a specific joint. That said, there's field tests such as the sit and reach. You've probably tried that before. And very commonly, while they might give us kind of a snapshot of how flexible someone is, they're not actually giving us joint range of motion in degrees. So sit and reach, great example. What we're really looking at there is the flexibility of all the muscles in the posterior chain. So that's going to include gastrocnemius, it's going to include hamstrings, gluteal muscles, spinal muscles, because they're all connected in this chain. And that doesn't even factor in limb length variations. So if someone has short legs but really long arms, they're naturally going to score better in the sit and reach than someone who has long legs but little T-Rex arms. So field tests may not be as accurate for the assessment of flexibility, but they can be helpful if you want a quick snapshot of a variety of joints throughout the body. As a fitness dimension, flexibility is certainly important for everyone. Of course, I've got some videos here showing some extreme flexibility. You'll see this with dancers, martial artists, uh, gymnasts, anyone that would need a high degree of range of motion in order to perform those particular tasks. Enjoy the videos that I've curated for you. I particularly like the sport acrobatics videos because this is like gymnastics to a whole different extreme. I mean, are you kidding me? Look at what these gals are doing. It's just crazy. <laughs>
to perform this prolonged large muscle movement. If one was to assess aerobic power, the best assessment is VO2 max. So in reference to the neuromuscular series, the metabolism series, cardiovascular series, respiratory series, there's a piece to the VO2 max puzzle in every single one of those systems. And all of that collectively helps give rise to VO2 max. You gotta have a good heart, you gotta have good lungs, you gotta have lots of mitochondria, which may mean that you've gotta have a lot of type one fibers. So there's just a lot of pieces of that puzzle. In reference to the LT VO2 max episode, remember that on the way up to VO2 max, you're gonna cross lactate threshold and that's when you light the fuse to that metabolic time bomb. So the higher your VO2 max is, the higher your endurance ceiling is, the higher your lactate threshold or endurance floor is gonna be. And if you can operate at a higher exercise intensity, but still be below lactate threshold, that means you could theoretically exercise forever without incurring fatigue. So what I've got on screen for you is Elliot Kipchoge. He's the current world record holder in the marathon, which is just over two hours. But a few years back, Nike decided to see if they could push the marathon under two hours. So they identified some of the top talent in the world and they trained them as perfectly as you could, threw tons of money and resources at them, and they set up the perfect racing situation for a record to essentially be broken. They developed special shoes, they had pace groups, perfect temperature, no elevation of the race course and so on. And Elliot ended up taking about two minutes off his own world record. Now granted, it actually couldn't be a world record because of all these perfect conditions they set up, but they really wanted to find out, is it possible, if we throw tons of resources at this, can someone go under two now? Not 10 years, 20 years from now, but can they do it right now? And Elliot, in that effort, went two minutes faster than his previous world record. It was two hours, in 25 seconds, so close. I mean, for context, a marathon is 26 miles and he went two hours and 25 seconds. So he was less than one second off per mile in order to go under two. So they ended up trying again more recently and that's when he did it. That's the video I've got here for you, is him actually going under two. Now granted, it's not a world record because of the the pace groups and, and the perfect conditions and everything that they use. But he showed the world, he showed himself, showed other competitors that it is possible for a human to be able to run a marathon sub two. Now, for context, that's just over four minute, 30 second miles. And he did 26 of them. I mean, it's just, it's absolutely phenomenal what this guy's aerobic power is. So I thought it would be fun, for reference, if you could see other people trying to run at that exact pace. Trying to survive something like that for two hours would be, would be almost impossible. It's, it's unreal that somebody did that.
blistering. My gosh, what an, what an amazing human. Okay, I'll calm down and I'll kick us back to lecture. <laughs> With that in mind, <clears throat> please remember that the reason why some of these world-class endurance athletes can operate at just insane paces for such a prolonged period of time is not because they have a fantastic immediate system, fantastic glycolytic system, it's because their VO2 max, their aerobic power is just so incredibly high that their lactate threshold is also high, meaning they, they've got a large operational range that they can exercise within but without lighting the fuse that metabolic time bomb. That seems to be the key. And as I've also discussed before, aerobic power isn't just something that athletes should be concerned with. This has ramifications for everyone. For those folks that are on the bottom end of VO2 maxes, 12, 15, something like that, because they can't operate their VO2 max very long they're, because they're crossing lactate threshold, their functional capacity is considerably limited. I mean, going upstairs is very difficult, perhaps impossible. Trying to park far away from a store, walk in and then walk around the store, likely not possible as well. So everyone stands to benefit from a high VO2 max or at least an improvement in VO2 max. And I suppose I saved the best for last. This next fitness dimension is anaerobic power. In reference to your ninja notes, it's defined as the amount of work that can mechanically be performed based on the ATP yield derived from your anaerobic energy system. So that would be your immediate system and your glycolytic system. As we've discussed already in a previous episode, the Wingate test is a fantastic test of anaerobic power because you're using both immediate and glycolytic systems in that test. And particularly as the immediate system dies out, gives you a really good picture of what the glycolytic system can do when it's the dominant system. You may remember that athletes who tend to perform at higher intensities in an intermittent fashion, like soccer athletes, basketball athletes, hockey athletes, they stand to benefit from a lot of anaerobic power and by extension, so really easy to assess their anaerobic power with the wind gate. In fact, hockey loves it. Hockey, because the skating mimics the test so well, they use the wind gate test in the combine. They'll use the wind gate to train anaerobic power. So, so you'll find a lot of hockey players using the wind gate for testing or training. I don't know if I can talk about wind gates without showing you uh, someone else you might be familiar with. This is a younger Justin throwing down on his very own wind gate. <laughs> Look at him, just a kid. Speaking of kids, this is my son Clark when he was all of six drive, years old drive, drive, doing his drive, very drive, own drive, version drive. of the wind gate. Come on, come on, here we go, here we go, here we go, come on buddy. And it's certainly worth mentioning, I keep focusing on wind gate, wind gate, wind gate for anaerobic power, but that's not the only way that you can assess anaerobic power. There's a variety of tests. Some of them are jumping tests, some of them are sprinting tests. There's one that's known as the Maximal Accumulated Oxygen Deficit Test, or MAOD, you'll see in your Ninja Notes. Think of that as EPOC, which I've referred to in one of the previous metabolism series. So there's a variety of ways that we can try to characterize and quantify that. But coming back to this idea of anaerobic power, you know, it's not just joint or muscle specific. There's a lot of things that go into anaerobic power, just like aerobic power. So in contrast to muscular power, think of anaerobic power as more of a whole body fitness dimension. There's a lot of components to it. 
And that's it. Those are the fitness dimensions that I would like for you to know for this training series. Quick study tip. I really like you to focus on the points to ponder in your ninja notes. It's important for you to understand what the fitness dimensions are for sure. Uh, it's important for you to understand how you would assess them. Perhaps most importantly, I'd like for you to understand the intersections between some of these fitness dimensions. Some of them complement one another. Some of them seem to contradict one another. I would like for you to put on your thinking cap to figure out which ones are complementary or contradictory. Certainly, if you have some questions on that, reach out to me, reach out to the TAs. We'd love to be able to help you with that application. But that goes beyond simple memorization. And if you're wise ninjas, you'll spend some time in that area as well. <laughs> I've always been told that a full body, heavy, black, cotton outfit would be ideal for performance. But I'm <laughs> beginning to reevaluate that after my attempt to beat Kip Joge's sub two hour marathon pace. <laughs> anyway, I hope that you guys enjoyed this episode on fitness dimensions. Check out the next episode where I'll discuss some of the basic fitness principles that will lay a foundation for the content to come in this series. I wish you all well. Take care, ninjas. <laughs>